Because I was still a poor college student, I checked out most of the books that the professor recommended from the library. To my surprise, when I looked for a copy of Some Mistakes of Moses in KU's gigantic, humanities-focused Watson Library, I couldn't find it. The only place it showed up was the Spencer Research Library, a library I'd never heard of and had never been to. When I arrived at Spencer Library, it was, unlike Watson, completely empty of visitors other than myself. At the end of a long, vacant lobby, a woman sat at a desk to receive visitors. After having me fill out a card with the catalog number of Some Mistakes of Moses, she told me to have a seat in the reading room and that the librarian would bring it to me. After about five minutes, a tall, kindly man in his sixties arrived with my book and gently set it down on the reading stand in front of me. To my surprise, the book looked ancient. As I turned its brittle pages, I realized why I had had to come to the Spencer Research Library to read it. The book had been published in 1898, over 100 years ago. Robert Greene Ingersoll was born in 1833 and died in 1899. He was a talented American orator whose speeches were attended and exuberantly appreciated by literary giants such as Walt Whitman and Mark Twain. His speeches were an influential catalyst for the Golden Age of Free Thought, which lasted from 1856 until the early 1900s. Despite his cognitive and linguistic assets as a leader, his radical views against religion and slavery and for the rights of women effectively prevented him from holding a public office higher than Attorney General. As I opened the book and began reading, I was overwhelmed and surprised by its positive and ambitious aspirations. I want to do what little I can to make my country truly free, to broaden the intellectual horizon of our people, to destroy the prejudices of ignorance and fear, to do away with the blind worship of the ignoble past, with the idea that all the good and great are dead, and that the living are totally depraved, that all pleasures are sins, that sighs and groans are alone pleasing to God, that thought is dangerous, that intellectual courage is a crime, that cowardice is a virtue, that a certain belief is necessary to secure salvation. This statement was one of the first of many passionate and inspiring arguments I encountered for the intellectual freedom and goodwill offered by the ideas underpinning agnostic atheism. As I read on, I saw that Ingersoll also wanted clergy to be able to think freely and not be constrained by their congregations. I am a great friend to the clergy, in spite of all they may say against me. I am going to do them a great and lasting service. The pulpit should not be a pillory. Much of the book contained intuitive observations about the absurdities in the Bible that often go unquestioned and unaddressed by Christians. One such absurdity that particularly bothered Ingersoll was the idea that God himself regularly created something out of nothing, which revealed a hypocrisy in Christian apologetics, since Christians so often criticize atheists for claiming something came from nothing. Another passionate criticism Ingersoll had of Christian culture was the idea that a single belief would be the difference between a person's salvation or damnation. He illustrated the absurdity of this idea with a commentary on Genesis that he called the rib story, where God created Eve since Adam could find no helper among the animals that he could appreciate. And finding that Adam was so particular, God had to make him a helper. And having used up all the nothing, he was compelled to take part of a man to make the woman with, and he took from the man a rib. Now we can imagine God with a bone in his hand, and about to start a woman, trying to make up his mind whether it should be a blonde or a brunette. Right here, it is only proper that I should warn you of the consequences of laughing at any story in the Holy Bible. When you come to die, your laughing at this story will be a thorn in your pillow. As you look back on the record of your life, no matter how many men you have wrecked and ruined, and no matter how many women you have deceived and deserted, all that may be forgiven you. But if you recollect that you laughed at God's book, you will see through the shadows of death the leering looks of fiends and forked tongues of devils. Let me show you how it will be. For instance, let's say it is the day of judgment. When a man is called up by the recording secretary, or whoever does the cross-examining, he says to his soul, where are you from? I am from the world. What kind of man were you? Well, uh, I was a good fellow. I loved my wife. I loved my children. My home was my heaven. 
My fireside was my paradise. To sit there and see the lights and shadows falling on the faces of those I love, that to me was a perpetual joy. I never gave them one solitary moment of pain. I don't owe a dollar in the world, and I left enough to pay my funeral expenses and take care of the ones I loved. That is what kind of man I was. Did you belong to a church? I did not. They were too narrow for me. They were always expecting to be happy simply because somebody else was being damned. Did you believe the rib story? What rib story? Oh, do you mean that Adam and Eve business? No, I did not. To tell you the God's truth, that was a little more than I could swallow. To hell with him! Next! Where do you come from? I'm from the world, too. Do you belong to any church? Yes, sir, and to the Young Men's Christian Association. What is your business? Cashier in a bank. Did you ever run off with any of the money? Uh, I don't like to tell. Well, you have to. Yes, sir, I did. How much did you run off with? $100,000. Did you take anything else with you? Yes, sir. I took my neighbor's wife. Did you have a wife and children of your own? Yes, sir. And you deserted them? Oh, yes. But such was my confidence in God that I believed he would take care of them. Have you heard from them since? No, sir. Did you believe the rib story? Ah, oh, bless your soul. Yes, I believed it all, sir. I often used to be sorry that there were no harder stories to believe in the Bible so that I could show what my faith could do. You believed it, did you? Yes, with all my heart. Give this man a heart. I simply wanted to show you how important it is to believe these stories. Of all the authors in the world, God hates critics the most. Sitting alone in the research library's reading room, I found myself trying to hold back uncontrollable laughter. This was the most compelling criticism of salvation by belief I had ever encountered. These were all ideas I had considered briefly and vaguely as a Christian. But Ingersoll drove these premises of faith to such an extreme yet undeniable logical conclusion that I could not deny their absurdity. His argument clearly illustrated how salvation by belief alone was contradictory with the idea that God was a just and reasonable being. This type of argument is called reductio ad absurdum, and it is a commonly employed and powerful type of philosophical argumentation. Its successful employment underpins the powerful arguments in many of the videos of such YouTube comedy giants as Dark Matter 2525 and Non-Stamp Collector. One of the keys to making it philosophically valid is that one must present their opponent's arguments realistically and precisely before showing why they are absurd. Failing to represent an opponent's position accurately and fairly before criticizing it produces a straw man and a subsequent appeal to ridicule. Ingersoll was the first atheist I personally had encountered who employed reductio ad absurdum correctly. On the other hand, I was starting to realize that my own closed-mindedness as a Christian had kept me from fully considering arguments like the one Ingersoll was presenting. Now that I no longer filtered my thoughts and perceptions, I was finding that I could think sharper and faster. My mind was changing, and I was starting to mature and improve my thinking in a practical way that I hadn't even realized I was missing out on before losing my faith. As I handed some mistakes of Moses back to the librarian, he said, That is a very important book. Too many people have forgotten about it. My next book was Who Wrote the New Testament by Burton Mack, which I was able to find by myself at Watson Library. One thing that surprised me while searching for the book was just how many academic books there were analyzing the Bible and criticizing the traditional Christian perspective of it. Mack's most compelling insight for me was that today's Orthodox Christianity was just one of the many Jesus movements that existed in early Christianity. The only reason Christians believe what they do today was because the other Jesus movements had been suppressed by the now Orthodox Christianity as heretics. One can imagine a similar occurrence in a hypothetical future America where Mormonism has become the Orthodox version of Christianity and Baptists and Pentecostals are referred to as the heretics of the past. The next book on my list was by someone considered a modern Christian heretic, the Anglican Bishop John Shelby Spong of the Diocese of Newark. 